Welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. This week in the struggle to halt global warming, we look at a promising practical way and faltering political will. A new carbon-sucking super tree is sprouting on our farms which can grow at least four times faster than average timber. We'll introduce you to Paulonia. In the coal mining heart of America, they've had deadly floods that may have been worsened by climate change, but making that link is uncomfortable for local residents and their politicians. Here, we face uncommon drought with hosepipe bans coming this weekend and another heat spike forecast for next weekend. And years of economic turmoil resulting from fossil fuel dependence. All this comes as Conservative Party members are chewing their pencils and pondering where to put their cross. A cross to decide who will be the next Prime Minister. But in weeks of leadership campaigning, talk of climate and the environment has been conspicuous by its almost total absence. And when green stuff was mentioned, it was mostly to be sceptical about climate-friendly policies. Why is this and how will it affect government decisions. I hovered around at Sky's special leadership programme to find out. In a few moments' time, these seats will be full of Conservative Party members, some of the very people who will be deciding who will be our next Prime Minister. But what interests me is to what extent their decision is influenced by what the contenders have had to say about climate change. What for you are the three or four most important issues you'd like our new Prime Minister to, to address? The borders issue. Law and order. Look after the old a bit more. Housing. The NHS. Just want to see them make a success of Brexit. The cost of living crisis. The fuel crisis. None of the members I spoke to here listed climate or environment as one of the issues that really mattered to them. And I guess that tells you something. So for one or two of them, I decided to ask them about it. Climate policy is important to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. You didn't list it, though. No. Absolutely. I appreciate how important it is, but not, not in my decision making, no. I don't think net zero by 2050 should come at the cost of sorting out this whole cost of living crisis. So maybe something temporarily in place and then looking to green policies in the future. There are other problems which I would like to see sorted long before that. of course, and Rishi Sunak as well. Good evening to you both. We can make it more likely that the economy grows. Will the real Liz Truss please stand up? The lights on the economy are flashing red. A cynical motivation to try and get you into number 10. Well, that's the end of this special battle for number 10 programme. And climate was mentioned uh, by Kay in discussion with Rishi Sunak, which gives me some stuff to talk about with my colleagues. And those colleagues are Helen Ann Smith, our business correspondent, and Thomas Moore, our science correspondent. I started that debate saying I was going to write down any time they mentioned <laughs> climate, and I had a blank piece of paper for a very long time. But they did get round to it, and certainly they got round to things to do with energy. But Helen Ann Smith, what did you make of it? Well, it was interesting, wasn't it? It was, uh, as you say, climate change didn't come up really at all for the front half of the programme. Um, you know, from my perspective, I was surprised that there was less conversation about energy bills, really surprised because we've had some diabolical predictions in the last week and every day new numbers come forward about just how high we expect those bills to get in the winter. You know, now in excess of you know, £3,500 for an average family, that is three times what it was last year. So really, really, really serious. We didn't hear much that would perhaps please people who are worried about climate change, but Thomas, one of the things I think we did hear, which was a surprise to me at least, was Rishi Sunak laying out some thoughts, if not policies, about energy saving. Yes, I think uh, many environmentalists will implore, applaud him for talking about home insulation, uh, energy efficiency and so on. Many people watching are living in homes where we can help improve the insulation. Loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, smart temperature controls. And he did actually say there would be £300 savings uh, to the, the bills if you started uh, insulating people's homes. And of course that is the quickest way of reducing energy consumption in this country. And Liz Truss repeated her commitment to, uh, for, to a moratorium on these, the green energy levies. I would also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy level to save people money on fuel bills. Uh, how much would that save anyone? Oh, it's, it's really not going to be very much. I mean, we're talking about roughly £150 a year. Yeah. So, you know, you put that into context, and, and actually, I have to say, 
you know, Rishi Sunak is slightly guilty of this as well because his answer is to cut VAT on energy bills. We're talking about a really very small amount, so it's not going to make a huge amount of difference to people, but it would make a very big difference to the climate. I'm a bit confused about that as well because mon that money has to come from somewhere, doesn't it? I mean, it's commitment, legal commitment, not just to companies, but you've got to pay people on uh, who lower incomes from that. Yeah. Warm home discounts, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what this is what uh, Liz Truss has not talked about is, is how you're going to make up the, uh, that uh, if, if it's not going to come through bills. And but would it come from general taxation? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I think the broader point is is the messaging um, and how it might undermine uh, the public's view of of the green commitment. If you start removing it from the bill, then perhaps it's not quite so important after all. And I think that's quite dangerous, a slippery slope, if you like, uh, because you might start eroding uh, that that belief that net zero is the way the government's going. So, with just shy of a month until the new PM is decided, I'm intrigued to know if contenders' words on the campaign trail will be matched by their decisions in office. Joining me to chew over the future of this government and climate policy are Baroness Worthington, who sits as a crossbencher in the House of Lords and helped author the Climate Change Act, and Rebecca Powell, a Conservative MP who was, until recently, an Environment Minister. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and I come to you first, Rebecca, if that's OK. Uh, do you share my slight disappointment about how little we've heard about climate change during this campaign? Well, it's not for the want of me trying. Uh, <laughs> I've actually had uh, conversations, in fact, with both candidates about this very thing. And I would say there's a lot of conversation behind the scenes. But it's quite interesting, isn't it, uh, that when we've gone out to the hustings, uh, the general public uh, have asked, I would say, actually, yes, less questions than I would have expected. There were some on Sky last night, which was good. And I've certainly been asked questions when I've gone out um, to events linked to this leadership election. And because as far as I'm concerned, uh, as the Environment Minister, yeah. and having worked in government across this portfolio uh, for the last three years, uh, it is right up there at the top of the agenda but and the, linking into the policies. And indeed needs uh, to a great, a great is, deal more. Forgive me, Rebecca. The assumption is it may be a stereotype, is that the actual electorate that they're catering to, those 160,000 Conservative members, don't you know, care a huge deal about this. It's not one of their top priorities. Do you think that's fair? Well, it's interesting because amongst the general population, it is one of their top priorities. Yeah. You've got cost of living, NHS, and then environment and climate change. So I think it's very much about getting that message across that actually this is all linked to cost of living and how mm. we live. If we can get uh, renewable energy and the programme underway and really drive that, of course, what that will do is reduce uh, our energy, energy bills and make us much more secure. So it's a matter of linking those things up. So, uh, Bryony Worthington, I suppose that, that question I posed in the introduction, um, do you think that the kind of tone that we've heard, not much mentioned at all, and when it has been mentioned, it's been quite sceptical about climate-friendly policies, do you think that'll be reflected when they get into government? Or are, you know, some environmentalists getting their knickers in a twist unnecessarily? No, I, I think it is important that um, you, you listen to what these candidates are saying. They're going to be our Prime Minister. And uh, you would expect them to be across a brief which is, you know, commensurate with that office. And, and climate change is of huge significance, both domestically and internationally. So the fact that they may not be uh, speaking to those agendas with enthusiasm it does, I think, cause a lot of people concern. And it would be a terrible thing for Britain to start going back on its climate change commitments because we're just starting to see investment flowing. The confidence amongst industry that we are going to stick to this agenda is really high at the moment. And what we don't want to see is lots of chopping and changing and, and signalling that we're not serious about it because that will cost us jobs, cost us investment, and it will also diminish us on the international stage where we've had such a strong leadership role. But when they get into office, do you think that the, the, the penny will drop? Famously, I think it was Patrick Vallance sort of took Boris Johnson aside and, and, and made him realise the importance of, of, of climate change. Might we see something there and they might kind of be a bit more enthusiastic about these policies? Bryony? 
Well, yeah, uh, yes, I hope so. I mean, uh, just look, you know, turning to Rishi Sunak, he's been the chancellor for two years, and he's been chancellor during an extraordinary period of inflation that's driven by fossil fuel prices, and yet the policies he's introduced have shown no awareness at all of what the real solutions are to that problem. So I am a little bit concerned that he could spend two years as chancellor, not understand the gravity of the situation of climate change, and nor understand that the problem of inflation is also yeah. about fossil fuels, and that the solutions to both are, as, as Rebecca says, <laughs> changing the way we produce energy so that we use more of our homegrown electricity. Rebecca, you've, I think, come out in support of, of, of Rishi Sunak. So given what we've heard, you must be a bit disappointed about his, uh, his, uh, what he's had to say about climate change. He's you know, not in favour of onshore wind, even when it's supported by local communities, but is in favour of fracking when it's supported by local communities. That doesn't feel right if you're concerned about climate change. I think, actually, I disagree with um, what we've just heard uh, from the previous speaker. I actually think um, Rishi, in particular, really understands climate change, and he was the first one that did come out saying, of course, we've legislated for net zero by 2050, so there's no way he'd backtrack on that. I think Hardly been putting uh, in certainly the some of the other candidates, you know, but, you know uh, uh, were very questionable on this. He certainly isn't. And also, I actually uh, think he's done a great deal to move this agenda forward in terms of committing to make... Uh, the UK, a net zero finance centre of the world. He's done so much on green finance and all of those policies so that we can leverage in outside investment and partnership funding. That's going to be absolutely critical to driving forward this agenda. Bryony, we are in a cost of living crisis and uh, Liz Truss has said she would remove the green levies and that cuts £150 potentially off people's bills. That could be a big deal for some people who are struggling to pay their bills, couldn't it? Uh, I'm afraid that's a complete distraction. The real problem is that we've got extraordinary energy prices at the moment, and, and those are delivering windfall profits of extraordinary levels to the upstream oil and gas sector. And the Chancellor's windfall tax, unfortunately, was a good policy, but he delivered it in such a way that he is encouraging them to spend more chasing down fossil fuels and not using that money to help people through this winter, when actually we need to be focusing on keeping people safe, helping people understand how they can keep warm. And it really is truly going to be a terrible winter ahead. Forgive me, uh, Bryony, we must uh, wrap it up there. But Bryony Worthington and Rebecca Powell, thank you very much indeed for your time. And just a reminder that you can watch our special Tory leadership programme, The Battle for Number 10, across all of our platforms, including the Sky News mobile app and YouTube. Well, just before we take a quick break, time for one of your questions. Sylvia writes in to ask about hydrogen cars. She had a friend in Italy who had one in the 1980s, and the only thing to come out of the exhaust was water. Why, she asks, is that not a good option here? Great question, Sylvia, and we'll answer it after the break. Welcome back to The Climate Show. Before the break, we had a question from Sylvia on why we don't have more hydrogen cars. Hydrogen-powered cars emit just water from the exhaust pipe and their range is greater than most electric vehicles. But currently, creating the hydrogen itself emits lots of greenhouse gases at the production stage. And the biggest drawback is probably distribution. The great advantage of electric cars is that we have a grid that runs to nearly every home and business. Compare that to producing a hydrogen delivery network with tankers or pipes. But we should never shut the door on any green tech and hydrogen power is finding favour with trucks and construction vehicles. And, of course, we'd love more questions from you. You can scan the QR code here or go to any of our social media accounts and put your questions in the comments. Now, it is a key weekend for green politics in America. The Inflation Reduction Act, the slightly confusing name for a bill which focuses on climate and energy spending, is likely to pass its most critical political, political hurdle in Washington. At stake is hundreds of billions in funding for low-carbon tech and assistance for coal-producing states, one of which, Kentucky, has just experienced deadly floods. And our US correspondent, Mark Stone, has been there. It is little over a week since the most devastating floods ripped through communities in this stunning corner of Kentucky. 
I've never seen anything like this. We travel deep into these Appalachian valleys, past rivers that were overwhelmed, roads out, and homes gone forever. Have you ever seen water like this? No, no, never, and I've lived here my whole life. The people here are not well off, and they lost everything. It took about five minutes, for like I have about five to six minutes, and it was gone. But what about the bigger picture, the cause? Climate change. Possibly, yes. In a place called Troublesome Creek, we met a man called Nolan Allen. He'd approached us. He'd wanted to show us what the flooding had looked like. Obviously, you're scared. I've never seen the water in my driveway that far. It's unimaginable. And do you have a view about climate change and that debate? Well, I could. This is cold country. The people, most of my family, my friends, people I know, went to school with, their livelihoods were coal-based, pretty much. And uh, we can't immediately go to any other form of energy. We just, we don't have the capability. It's just not as simple as going green, going electric. You can't. It is not. You cannot. You can't. Politics is, of course, entwined in all of this. Kentucky is a red state. Climate change skeptic Donald Trump won here in 2020 with a whopping 62% of the vote. And yet the governor is a Democrat. Andy Bashir won his election by a whisker thanks to support in the cities, but not so much out here. And so he must walk a fine line. We know we'll still be finding people sadly in the days to come. He knows how divisive the climate change issue is. Three full days after the floods, he hadn't mentioned it until we asked him. Listen, I believe in climate change. I believe it causes more devastating weather. But my job right now is to get families back together, get a roof over their head, and make sure they have enough to eat. They just want to find their relatives, and they don't want their experience to be co-opted in a larger debate. Eight hours drive to the east, Washington, D.C., the capital of the world's second biggest polluting nation. Mr. Manchin. Here, that larger debate is front and center, but progress is hard going. Remember Glasgow when Joe Biden made massive commitments to cut carbon emissions? Well, that was all based on the cooperation of the people in there. And over the past few months, there has been gridlock. The deal that President Biden hopes to sign is a compromise, but it does include loans for electric cars to cut emissions and crucially support for states like Kentucky. Tax credits totaling $30 billion to encourage domestic manufacturing of wind turbines, solar panels and batteries. In all, the Biden administration says it would slash the country's carbon emissions by roughly 40% by 2030. The promises he made in Glasgow within reach. That's all very well, but it's too late for the people of Troublesome Creek, whose experiences now seem to be the new normal. Mark Stone, Sky News. Well, from some political turmoil to a potential natural solution, this modest length of building timber holds carbon that was captured through the leaves as it grew as a tree a few years back. It is this capacity of woodlands to absorb CO2, the principal culprit in global warming, that has made tree planting a priority. Your average tree will absorb or sequester around 22 kilograms of carbon dioxide every year. Is that a lot? Well, on average, each of us is responsible for emitting 227 times that amount, nearly five tonnes per person per year. So what if there were a super tree that could suck up carbon much faster? In the Garden of England, something is breaking through the soil which Kentish farmer Doug Wanstall believes will be massive. My foot is to show you something that I think is going to play a major role in the reversal of climate change. And where is it? It's right here beneath our feet. This? Or at our feet. Yes, this tree. This is a Paulonia. So it's all about speed of growth, is it? Because it's not wowing me with its size right yeah, now. Yeah, it really is. It will grow from that to the size of a 40-year-old oak in about eight to 10 years. 
Now you've got something behind your back there. What's the point in that? Uh, so this is this is actually the timber. So okay. this thing will grow into something that we can cut something this like this out of very quickly. Doug's transforming his farm to be more climate friendly while still producing plenty of food. He makes his own fertilizer from distillery waste, coats barns in solar panels, and grows fly larvae. This is currently being heated um, with electricity from the solar panels. To feed to his free range hens. 700 Paulonia trees are planted in rows across this field where cattle graze. The trees will absorb a lot of the nutrients that the cows are depositing all over the field <laughs> um, and they'll use that for their growth. So here we are, Tom. This is a tree that's one year older than the one we just, we've just seen over there. Wow, that is rapid. So it's put on nearly, well, I don't know, seven foot, a couple of metres. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a foot down, down there, so that's at least eight foot tall now. Um, put on about sort of six and a half feet in the first year or last year, and it's put about two-ish on this year so far in a very dry year. And roughly how long would it take to make a tree similar to the size of the one behind you? So uh, it will be that sort of size in about four years. But give me some figures on this in terms of carbon capture, because that's what we're all yeah. about here, drawing the carbon out of the atmosphere. Absolutely. So we've calculated that these trees will average through their 10-year life cycle, 63 kilos per tree per year of carbon sequestered into leaf matter, roots and timber. And how does that compare to, I don't know, conifers or, or other trees? Very roughly, it's double most other species of tree. Uh, compare it to a traditional woodland plantation and it's about four times the amount. Wow. And could this really be a long-term carbon storage answer? Yeah, absolutely. It's really important to lock away the carbon, you know, in this timber into buildings for, you know, centuries to come. And we've got a good example we can show you over here. Some funding from this project comes from carbon offsetting, where other companies will pay Doug for absorbing emissions on their behalf. But his passion comes from locking up carbon in buildings for the long term. He gave me a history lesson from his ancient barn. Within this timber is embedded CO, atmospheric CO2 from the 15th century and before. <laughs> and it really is our, our vision that we start to use this timber, Paulonia timber, to do exactly the same thing in the 21st century. Sequester 21st century CO2 into construction materials to build the buildings of the future. Once considered just botanical exotics, Paulonia trees could combine storing carbon for everyone with banking some income for farmers. While Doug is mixing trees with grazing, over in Suffolk on the Euston estate, they have dedicated 200 hectares to Paulonia and planted 116,000 saplings. They went in the ground earlier this summer and as a non-native species, they had to undergo rigorous examination from Forestry England to check out the environmental impact. They got the all clear and other landowners are expected to plant hundreds more hectares next year. So, Paulonia, in a future top ten list of baby names, what do you think? And finally, do you want to see a nudie branch? Thought so. Ta-da! <laughs> Nudie branch is the group name for sea slugs, and this extraordinarily jolly specimen, just two centimetres long, has been spotted for the first time in UK waters. It should be addressed as Babakina anadoni and can be seen near an uninhabited rock by the Isles of Scilly. It truly is a beautiful world. Bye. <laughs>